Namaste and welcome back to Freckles and Blondie, a review of this slightly tragic, always dramatic episode of Lost. <laughs> I'm Tiffany. And I'm Randy. And today's episode, Deus Ex Machina, aired on March 30th, 2005, nearly a month after Numbers. Oh, a little bit of a break there. Yeah, like a big break. I mean, that had to have been agony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All you Netflix bingers just have no idea what life was like. Yeah, <laughs> all the pain and suffering we went through watching yeah. it live. Like a month break. It's just crazy. It was directed by Robert Mandel and written by our ultimate power duo, Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse. This is the first time we've had our big guns, Lindelof and Cuse, write an episode together. Yeah. When I saw that they had written it, I got really excited. Yeah. And I mean, if it's like a sign of things to come, all the more excitement. <laughs> I love this episode. Do you? <laughs> you knew I would. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very Tiffany episode. It is. It's made for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly designed for me <laughs> and all the things that I love about Lost. Mm -hmm. What did you think? I like this episode. I'm not sure I love it. It It's very significant though it is it gets the wheels spinning on a lot of different plots right it almost feels like part one of what will be next week's episode because they like they feel very tied yeah. in my mind and like i was asking a bunch of questions to people on instagram and a lot of people were asking me things and saying things about the next episode because i think it's linked in everybody's mind yeah, it definitely has a feel of a part one, part two, so. Yeah, but I love it. I mean, I just love Locke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say, I think he is my favorite episode, or my favorite character in season one. I'm just going to commit to that. Okay. In season one, <laughs> not the whole show. In season one, yeah. I wouldn't say the whole series, but this season, he is, he's just my everything. I just <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, he's. He's endlessly fascinating. He is. I don't know. He's. I struggle with him sometimes, but... Yeah. There is just so much to unpack with him uh -huh. that, like, I just find that so intriguing. I find him so unique as a character. Like, there's no one on any show like Locke. It's, he's just endlessly fascinating. Yeah, that's 100% true. But I can see why, like, that would be also frustrating at the same time. <laughs> yeah, he's just a little bit hard to relate to a lot of the time. Right. His mind works in a way that is sometimes hard to connect with. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree. And for me, that's kind of the fun of it, <laughs> mm -hmm. to not exactly know what he's going to do next, because I think... um I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about stories and reading and watching TV, and I feel like it becomes predictable for me a lot of the times, mm -hmm. just because I have interacted with it so much. But someone like Locke is not predictable, and I think that's part of the fun. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about the title. Okay, let's talk about the title. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should talk about it in the beginning because so much of this episode relates to its title. Yeah, a good idea. So Deus Ex Machina is Latin, and it is God from the Machine, if you read it completely literally. But in ancient Greek theater, apparently there was this device that was like a crane that kind of lowered a character down onto the stage, and that character would represent God, and God would help the characters with like this sudden plot twist. And this term could mean any device within a plot that provides a sudden change or solution. And now, in script writing, this term will refer to a sudden solution in the story. The sudden, um, what's another word for solution? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but something that could come out of nowhere. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with the story, and sometimes the audience feels a little cheated. Um, I know that, like, when I watch shows... Like, with my husband, we'll be like, ugh, deus ex machina. <laughs> <laughs> you do not say that, do you? That's amazing. Yes. No, we seriously do. This is such a thing. <laughs> you guys are so smart. Yeah, I always knew this was a thing, but until I watched this episode and then read a little bit more about it, I'm not really sure I ever really fully understood this term and its history. 
You clearly didn't see my Facebook rant about Jon Snow this year. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I did see that rant because I feel like I argued with you about that for a very long time. Yes. Didn't you? I thought so. <laughs> oh, is that what you called him on there? Wow, I totally missed that. Yeah, that was total deus ex machina. Oh, my God. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because I felt like... There was a sudden twist of the plot just to save Jon Snow, and I feel like that happens to him all the time, so that, you know, we won't get into all the Game of Thrones issues I have, but... <laughs> Let's not. That was like a 42-comment Facebook argument that we had with multiple other people. We got real passionate. <laughs> we did, and then Harry Potter got dragged into it. It was a lot, but... <laughs> Things are always getting dramatic when Harry Potter gets dragged into it. Yeah, especially <laughs> when I'm involved, but... <laughs> But that was a, an example of this kind of thing. Where okay. You, just, you feel like the plot is contrived and it's not organic and the way it should really happen. I had trouble. Like, how does that relate to this episode, though? Well, I think that you can either look at it from that perspective or look at it from the ancient Greek perspective. And I'm kind of inclined to go the Greek Latin way mm -hmm. on that. Just because we have so many more allusions to that in the episode. Right. But it is a plot twist. I just wouldn't say that it's contrived. I guess it just literally kind of comes out of nowhere. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can see how it does. There are things that come out of, seem to come out of nowhere in this episode. I just didn't, I don't really feel cheated by this episode. Yeah, you know? it's, yeah, I think that there's, there's a distinction between, like, it comes out of nowhere and surprises you, and it comes out of nowhere and feels inauthentic to the show mm -hmm. and the world that we're in. And I don't think that this is that. I don't think we feel like this could never happen or anything like that. Right. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of references to God and machines, and I think that part is something worth following as we go through. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Let's do this. Previously on Lost, Locke broke everyone's hearts when people told him what he could or could not do. Then he and Boone discovered this really sweet hatch thing, but he could not figure out how to open it. We start in a flashback, and Locke appears to be working in a toy store. He's standing, so we know this is before whatever left him paralyzed. He is building an awesome setup for the board game Mousetrap, and he explains the rules of setting your traps to a young boy watching him. A nearby woman with red hair stares at Locke and then asks him where to find footballs. Locke tells her, but she continues staring at him a little too long before walking away. So I thought it was, like, interesting that Locke is playing a board game in both of his flashbacks. Like, in the last episode he was in, he was playing, like, this strategy game. Mm. And in this one, he's playing Mousetrap. Yeah. I didn't really even pick up on that. That is interesting. That can't be an accident, right? <laughs> sure, it's not. And then, you know, he also plays backgammon on the island with Walt, so... Right. Mm. Yeah. I, I like the, um... I guess this trap metaphor we get in this opening scene because it kind of reflects like the trap that Locke's dad sets up for him as the episode goes on. Oh, yeah. It's an interesting way to, to introduce this his backstory in this episode. Yeah, that's so interesting. I was thinking about like the fact that the game is Mousetrap and wondering why that game in particular. And the only thing I could think of is that Locke is a hunter so I guess he would enjoy playing a game where you're, like, hunting for things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I haven't played Mousetrap. <laughs> Me either. I guess I understand the fundamentals. Yeah. But I bet Rousseau is a boss at Mousetrap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to play against her in that game. <laughs> <laughs> she and Locke should totally play. Oh, can that, you imagine? That would be fun. <laughs> On the island, Locke and Boone have cleared the hatch of the dirt pretty well, but they still need to break in. Locke wants to go through the glass in the door, but Boone doesn't seem so sure. Locke tells him he needs to have faith. His trebuchet will get them in. Boone says they've been coming here for two weeks, but Locke never talks about himself. And Locke replies that his story is boring. <laughs> so funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
He and Boone crank away, lifting the point of the trebuchet higher and higher until they release the pressure and it comes crashing into the hatch. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it doesn't work, and Locke is pretty unhappy about that, screaming, this was supposed to work. Boone points out that some shrapnel from the broken trebuchet locked, lodges itself into Locke's leg. Locke says he's okay, but it's clear that he never noticed. Back at camp, Locke is panicking and feeling his legs. He sticks a needle in the burning end of a piece of wood against his skin, desperate to feel anything, and we cut to credits. So apparently, this trebuchet looks a lot like the device that we are talking about from ancient Greek theater, where they would drop someone in to be the god and like lift them like a crane. Okay. I learned that in researching. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> That's an interesting connection. Yeah, I had never heard of that or would have, I never would have made that connection myself, yeah. but I thought that was interesting. Yeah. But yeah, this moment when Locke is like, this was supposed to work and he just, you can see like the crack in him and he's losing his faith and it's just so sad like to watch him desperately like sticking his legs with things. Ugh, yeah. It hurts me. <laughs> it, it is sad. It also just, I mean, getting into this hatch has become this, his obsession. Yeah. It feels... Like, when he loses it after the, the trebuchet doesn't work, it's like, whoa, you... It feels like he really needs this to work in order for him to be okay. <laughs> That's true. It's a little alarming. Yeah. It's, like, not necessarily a healthy thing, how dependent he is on his faith in the island. Right. I don't think so, either. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely consuming him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, understandably so with all the things that he has discovered and now believes in. I can see why this has grabbed him the way it has, but yeah, not necessarily good news for him. Yeah, definitely not. So much of this is sold by, um, God, why am I blanking on his name? The actor. Terry O'Quinn. Terry O'Quinn. <laughs> he's just so good. Like, it just blows my freaking mind. Yeah, how he he's amazing. His panic is just so palpable, and I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> What is happening? Oh no, Locke. <laughs> I wish I could have watched this episode with you. <laughs> <laughs> we can rewatch it. I love it. <laughs> Boone is questioning absolutely everything and seems super skeptical of Locke's next attempts to get into the hatch. Locke says that everything breaks with enough force, but Boone is Boone and he asks what they'll do if that doesn't work. Locke says that then the island will tell them what to do. Boone asks about Locke's leg again, and he says it's fine. I love that little line where he says, everything breaks with enough force, because I feel like that is this episode for Locke. It's his faith kind of breaking. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even thought about that. I don't know. I'm kind of with Boone on this one. Like, <laughs> to me, it seems like, and maybe Boone says this again later, but if they were meant, if the island, as Locke believes, wanted them to get into this hatch, maybe it would have made it a little bit easier. Yes, but great things are not easily grasped, right? <laughs> <laughs> you and Locke would be best friends. Oh my we gosh. We so would. <laughs> I would love some advice from Locke. He would tell me everything I need to know for my life. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I can see, I can see you and Boone's point <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But I, I just, I know I'd hundred percent be with Locke. Like, okay, what else do we have to do? We're on this desert island. Let's get in this freaking hatch. We're gonna do this. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, peace out. I'm going back to the beach. Maybe I'll help work on the raft. I, this is not <laughs> going anywhere. You are out of here. <laughs> yeah. But I'm pretty skeptical about a lot of things. So that's just Do me. you think you would be that way still if you could suddenly walk again? If you hadn't been able to? Oh, no. If th that happened to me, I mean, that's a miracle. I would definitely be <laughs> all in. So It's funny because Locke is, like, you can see that he is a man of faith before this even happens to him. Right. Which is why it's... He's so fascinating that way. Right. He had this in him even before. Yeah. In a parking lot, Locke sees the red-headed woman again and chases her, but he's struck by a car. 
It's just another day for John Locke, though, and he bounces back up and catches up to the woman, asking why she's following him. She says she's his mother. In the next scene, she and Locke are at a cafe talking, and she says, you were adopted, weren't you? But no, Locke was never adopted. He lived in many foster homes, but was never adopted. He asks her what she wants from him, and she says she's here to tell him that he's special. He's part of a design. Her finding him is a sign of great things to come. Locke asks about his father, but she tells him he has no father. He was immaculately conceived. So, <laughs> they look they look the same age in this episode, don't you think? <laughs> like, the woman who's uh, playing his mother. Well, I think that with his hair piece and everything, we're supposed to see <laughs> Locke is younger than he is. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a totally, like, not important detail, but it was distracting <laughs> me the whole time, because I'm like, they look like they're the same age. But That's really funny, and we should look up the actors and see how far apart they actually are. <laughs> I meant to do that, and I forgot. I hadn't even thought about that. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just like, whoa, Locke came from gingers, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys are so connected. You're married to a ginger. <laughs> yes, I'm surrounded by gingers, for those of you who don't know. My, my husband and daughter <laughs> with their red hair. <laughs> so I'm fond of them, is what I'm saying. Mm. <laughs> but, man, is there, like, any significance to Locke getting hit by the car in the parking lot? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I didn't pick up on anything. I just thought that that was so crazy. Like, for anyone else, this would be a significant moment in their life, and Locke's just like, boom, <laughs> back up. Yeah, to me, it's it's like you said, that's just another example of a typical day for them. How is life? <laughs> like, I'm like, how many other times have you gotten hit by cars and just got up and walked away? Like, how awful has your life been <laughs> right. up until this point? <laughs> maybe John Locke needs to look for the signs and see that maybe he shouldn't follow this woman. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> she seems crazy, like immediately but yeah that's what i was thinking too she just seems untrustworthy from the beginning yes i see her and think nope don't believe anything she says she's crazy right absolutely but do you think Locke believes everything she's saying i mean he seems to be pretty taken in but he, he also seems a little bit worried so it's hard to tell yeah i mean He's going to hire a private detective, so right. I think he is skeptical, but I think he wants to believe it. I think he wants to be special and for there to be great things in his future, so... Oh, so sad. He wants this to be true. God, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> He's so tragic. I know. Sawyer has consulted Dr. Sun, looking for some herbal remedies. He asks which plant he's supposed to use, and when she points to one, he says, that isn't working. He tells her, thanks, and compliments her garden, which seems oddly polite for Sawyer. <laughs> when Kate asks Sun what's up, she tells her he's been having headaches and that aspirin doesn't help. Kate approaches Jack and asks what one would do if they had bad headaches every day. He asks if she's okay, and she says she's fine, but when she does, Jack suddenly turns skeptical because, well, he suddenly knows exactly who we are talking about. <laughs> she tells him that even though Sawyer thinks he's fine, he could be playing it down. But Jack doesn't want to try to help and get shot down by Sawyer again, so no matter how enticing the promise of a new nickname may be. <laughs> Oh, so I love this B storyline so yeah. much. It is one of my favorite things. <laughs> I always okay, so I feel like I feel like Lost has two strategies and like with their A and B storylines, mm -hmm. sometimes they are very connected and they're kind of drawing on the same theme. And then sometimes we have like a really heavy a storyline and a very light B storyline. Yeah, definitely. And this is definitely the light storyline and it's really, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's needed because Locke's storyline is, like you said, it's so tragic. Yeah, it's heavy and you need something like this to kind of balance it out. Yeah. And it's fun to like, it's fun to do something a little more lighthearted with these main characters. I feel like we often get like the comedy and that kind of stuff from, you know, Hurley and right. Charlie and Jen and, you know, like people who I'm not guess like they're not not important, but they're not our super main players. Right. Right. Yeah. But 
It's still so, yeah. it's delightful. I love everything about it. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> It is delightful. And I actually, I like Jack in these, in this storyline for the most part. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering how you felt about Jack in the storyline, but I mean, I think he pushes it a little far at some point, no, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sawyer deserves it, but <laughs> I mean, Sawyer does deserve it for sure. My, I mean, my issues with Jack are usually just inconsistency and in trying to figure out who he is. Mm-hmm. So. When he does something that's a little, like, ethically dubious, I'm like, okay, who are you? Who are you trying to be as a character? That's what I'm trying to figure out with him. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to okay. it when we get yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is really fun. And I like that he knows exactly what Kate is talking about. I mean, we don't even need to get Sawyer's name. Jack knows that that's who Kate would be worried about. And that's who would not approach him himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I like how he asked Kay if she's okay first. It's just, yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't blame him for not wanting to go help. Um, me either. <laughs> Why would you want to go help someone who's just mean to you? Right, just gonna, yeah, insult you. <laughs> <laughs> don't blame you at all. Back with Locke and Boone. Boone has arrived late to work. He is quitting this desperately underpaid and underappreciated job. <laughs> Getting into the hatch is hopeless, and it just can't be done. But Locke will not be told what to do, and they are supposed to do this. It wasn't an accident. But Boone asks why they haven't opened it yet, if they're supposed to. Locke says their faith is being tested, and the island will send them a sign. And at that moment, they both see a small plane sputter and crash to the island. Locke asks Boone if he saw it, and Boone is suddenly covered in blood, staring at the plane, chanting, Teresa falls up the stairs. Teresa falls down the stairs over and over again. Locke's mother stands in the background, pointing up toward the plane silently. Locke sees himself in a wheelchair again, saying, don't take it back. And suddenly, John wakes up from this horrible, horrible dream. Yeah, like, this is the worst so creepy. Dream. Yeah, it's terrifying. Oh, Boone is really creepy in this dream. Yeah, he is. Yeah, it, it, feel, it reminds me of the dream Claire had a few yeah. episodes ago. It's very startling. Yeah. It's, it's definitely that same kind of language. And Locke was in Claire's dream. Mm-hmm. Only he was the creepy one in that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is very prophetic. It's definitely major foreshadowing. Yeah. I mean, it's the reason why they go to look for that the plane in this episode. Do you feel like this is a sign sent from the island? Ugh, no. <laughs> What do you think it is? It's just a dream. <laughs> Dreams are crazy. Yeah. You think like Locke's subconscious wanted a sign so badly that he created this? Yeah, I do. So then why was the plane there? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, too, I'm too much of a skeptic to believe that the island sent him this sign. Because, I mean, I guess we'll talk about it later, but the when they go and find the plane, it didn't actually help them with anything, you know, at least as far as getting into the hatch. So, well, I mean, I think that's, I think it's too early to say whether it helped or not, but I mean, the fact is the plane is there and Locke knew it would be there and he shouldn't know that, right? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. It's so hard because, oh, I just don't know. I mean, that is, that is true, but Oh, I just, I'm just, I'm too skeptical to believe that the island subconsciously sent Locke this sign <laughs> about this plane that had crashed, you know, however many years ago. It just, it's like, it would be know. one thing if he had this dream and then they like march off to find the plane and they find, you know, something else instead. And he was like, oh, well, you know, my dream was wrong, but I found it. Like that would be different for him to find exactly what he was looking for. I'm inclined to say that it was fate. <laughs> I mean, sure, that's that's valid. I just, dreams are something that are so, dreams can be like anything. They can be so crazy. Yeah. You know, I, I've had dreams that when I've woken up, I've been like, wow, that was, I don't know what that was. I don't know what part of my mind that came from, <laughs> but I hope I never dream about that again, you know? So, yeah. But again, I mean, they're on this island. 
Locke has had this miracle happen to him, so I can see why you would think it would be fate. It's something. It's definitely something. It's some yeah. sort of magic or there's just, I mean, there's no word for it. <laughs> there's not. There's really not. <laughs> but I think Locke would call it fate or destiny. Yeah, definitely. Locke wakes Boone the next morning at dawn. In a flashback, Locke has hired a private investigator to find out if Emily Locke is truly his mother, and it turns out that she is. Apparently, she's been institutionalized a few times for a type of schizophrenia. Locke asks about his father, but the investigator tells him that it's one thing to research a mother who has sought him out, but for a father who has no idea what's going on, this stuff isn't meant to be, and it won't have a happy ending, he says. But of course, Locke wants to know. And would anyone really say no? Like, would anyone not want to know? I guess not. I mean, you figure at this stage in his life, he's had a... He's not had a father for that long. He's not had a mother or a father, really, at least, you know, his real parents. So yeah, why bring this all up now? I don't know. I've never been in that situation. So I guess most people would probably want to know either way. I mean, if somebody was standing right in front of me with a folder of information and they were like, this is your real father. Do you want to know? I'd be like, freaking yeah, just hand it to me. <laughs> There's no question here. <laughs> But I yeah. I think I would, like, I think I'd commend the people who don't know. I think that that's harder to just decide that you don't need whatever that is in your life and to yeah, just move it on. Yeah, it could, you know, like in this case, I mean, they could be a serial killer. They could be... <laughs> I love how often you go to, it could be a serial killer. <laughs> Guys, I listen to too many true crime <laughs> podcasts. I think I'm going to get murdered on a daily basis, so... <laughs> This is so funny. <laughs> I know, it's really sad. <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be harder to say no. So I would definitely admire those people who have that kind of self-preservation instinct. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Locke finds out that his father is Anthony Cooper, and he drives his adorable little red Volkswagen to the house. <laughs> he tells the gatekeeper there that he is Mr. Cooper's son, and to tell him that he doesn't want anything, he just wants to talk. The gatekeeper lets him in. When his father approaches, he tells Locke that this is awkward, to put it lightly. <laughs> he asks about his mother and how they found each other. Locke explains and mentions her telling him that he was immaculately conceived. Anthony laughs because, well, who wouldn't? Proclaiming, he must be God then. He says he had no idea about John and that he only heard from his mother later, after she'd put him up for adoption. He asks Locke if he has a family, and when he says no, he offers to take him hunting, to which Locke happily accepts. So what are your first impressions of Anthony Cooper? Ugh, um, I don't know. I'm immediately suspicious of him. Yeah? Yeah. I think his skepticism of Locke's mother makes me buy into him a little bit when I first meet him, <laughs> because... I'm like, okay, good. Yeah, I thought she was crazy too. So, right, right. At least we're on the same page here. But he seems, I think he's kind of charming. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, you have to like lose all knowledge of him after this scene, basically. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's like, it's just so hard for me to do that, knowing what's coming. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think he makes a fairly good impression. And I don't blame Locke for buying into this. Yeah, I don't know. Like, first of all, it seems it's so ballsy of Locke just to, I'm assuming there was no courtesy call beforehand, no letter in the mail. Hey, I'm your son. Do you want to like meet up? He just drives right up. Like, that is very ballsy True. of him to do. <laughs> so uh, it's just a little, I feel like he should be, Anthony Cooper should be more surprised that his adult son just shows up on his doorstep one day. Right. I feel like I would trust him a little bit more if he acted more surprised. Instead, he's just like, all right, well, you want to have a drink? It's like, whoa. Well, like, I mean, he could be anyone. Like, <laughs> he doesn't have any proof that Locke is his actual son. He could just be some random psycho. Yeah, that's true. I definitely agree. <laughs> and I also, I feel like, I feel like Locke should also be a lot more suspicious of his dad. Because it's like... From all the details we've had about Locke's life up until this point, it's been it's been pretty rough. So the fact that he just finds his father 
And after five minutes or so of talking, it's like, hey, you want to get to know each other? I want to go hunting? I'd be like, whoa, who is this dude that's just totally okay with this? You know? Yeah. I mean, I think he's seeing what he wants to see. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, we learned with Sawyer's episode on Confidence Man that the best way to con someone is for it to be their idea. And that's mm. exactly what Anthony Cooper does to him. It is totally Locke's idea. Locke hunts him down. And so it all feels in his own control. He's not thinking about being manipulated because he created the situation. You know, he showed up here without warning. So why would he be the one getting played? That's a very good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. I mean, Locke is just, he's so idealistic and he sees, he sees things the way he wants them to be sometimes, not the way they are. Yeah. I can understand, like, grasping for a connection with your family, especially when he's alone. You know, he doesn't even have, like, his own family, like a wife or anything like that. So I, I totally yeah. see him grasping for this. Yeah. And again, I, I think I'm more, I'm just more of a pessimistic person. <laughs> so like you said, Locke yeah. is an idealist. Right. Like, and it's obviously, I mean, Anthony Cooper is offering him something that he hasn't had his entire life, a relationship with his real father. So, Right. I think it's also significant that he refers to himself as God. Like, that is no yeah. small thing in this episode with the title we have. <laughs> oh, definitely. Also, especially because, I mean, like, what do you do with a God? You put your faith in them. And that is exactly what Locke is doing. He's just instantly putting his faith in this guy who he doesn't know. Yeah. Man, this episode is very well written. <laughs> it's so well written. Ah. What a surprise. <laughs> so brilliant. Locke is explaining his dream to Boone, conveniently leaving out the part about him being covered in blood. And <laughs> <laughs> he's saying that it was the most real thing he has ever experienced. Boone reads Randy's mind and asks Locke if he's been using the wacky mystery paste stuff again. And Locke laughs. Boone is still skeptical. But Locke asks who Teresa is and why he keeps saying or why he kept saying that Teresa falls up the stairs and down the stairs in his dream. This definitely means something to Boone as he suddenly agrees to go with Locke to find the plane. The raft is coming along quite well. Jen's ready to get the heck out of here. And Jack approaches Sawyer saying he knows about his headaches. Sawyer knows it was Kate's doing and he is pretty cranky about it. So Jack walks away. But Sawyer stops him, asking him some questions. He suddenly seems afraid that it's a brain tumor since his uncle died of that. Jack reassures him that he's probably fine. But when Sawyer doesn't look so sure, Jack asks if he wants him to do some tests. Sawyer tells him his insurance has run out, and Jack walks away laughing. I like fun Jack! <laughs> yeah! Isn't it fun? Yes, he's so much more likable when he asks him chill. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But yeah, they're, and they're so much, they're so good together when they're not yelling and screaming at each other yes. or trying to kill each other. Yes, like, it's great. Yeah. I feel like this scene, if written by somebody else, perhaps, Jack would have gotten really worked up by all of Sawyer's antagonizing. And I love that he doesn't. I love that he's just like, okay, dude, bye. <laughs> yeah. The fact that he keeps walking away whenever Sawyer says something nasty and keeps coming back yeah. is... Is brilliant. It is. That's exactly what he should do all the time. Yeah. It's like, I'm not putting up with your bullshit anymore. Like, peace out. I don't need this. He just, he seems so much more human in this moment than he normally does around Sawyer. It's so great. Yeah. I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Boone is still amazed that Locke knows about Teresa. They're walking toward Locke's dream plane when Locke stumbles and falls. Boone asks what's wrong with his leg. Locke suddenly notices a rosary and picks it up. When Boone asks where it came from, Locke knocks down from the tree a decaying old body of what looks like a former priest. Ooh, so I have a question. Yeah. I don't know if it was in this scene or not, but in one of the scenes where they're, you know, trying to find this dream plane, Locke pulls out a, I think it's a compass at one point and looks at it. Oh. But didn't he give his compass to Saeed? Yeah. And tell him that he didn't need it anymore? Yeah, I thought he did. I don't remember him taking out a compass, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Maybe he has another one. I don't know. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, that could reflect his loss of faith. 
you know? Because before, he was just like, well, the island will take me exactly where I need to go. I don't need a compass or anything. Island will yeah. get me. But he's losing his faith, and that's his whole issue. So, yeah, I can see him, like, pulling out a compass, like, okay, let me just be sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. I like that. I like that better than an inconsistency. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me too. Just go with that. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is now. <laughs> At his father's house... Locke is super psyched to be back hunting with his father again. He walks into the house to suddenly see Anthony strapped up to a dialysis machine. He says that Locke wasn't supposed to be here until 12, but Locke was pretty sure he'd said 11. He explains that he needs a kidney transplant, but it's a long line on the donor list. He tells Locke he doesn't want him to worry about it. And here's where Anthony loses me. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I'm like, oh, okay, this was definitely too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. This is clearly orchestrated. Yeah. It's just, he's, his, Anthony Cooper is so smart. Like, he plays Locke so well. Yeah, he does. And honestly, I don't know if I, if I was in that same situation, if I would have been suspicious at that point. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, who in their right mind would steal a kidney from someone? Like, that is insane, you know? <laughs> yeah, that would never, like, occur to any normal human being. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, if I'm Locke in that situation, I don't think I would be suspicious. But me as a viewer, like, now I definitely am. So I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Did Locke really get the time wrong? Probably not. He's super jazzed about this whole situation. He was probably counting down the minutes to the time he could come. So Right. <laughs> exactly. It's not like he would have gotten that time wrong. Right. So. You know that he wrote it in his agenda as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. God. <laughs> why are people such dicks? No, to Locke especially. It's just not Seriously. right. <laughs> they just hit him with their car and just keep going. <laughs> yeah, he works in a toy store, for God's sake. Like, leave him alone. <laughs> He's just a nice man who works in a toy store. Seriously. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> but yeah, another significant callback to the title, because if we're kind of thinking of Anthony Cooper as God, here he is attached to a machine, God from the machine. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Gosh, they really hit that theme yes, over and over do. again. They are not playing around here. <laughs> This is serious stuff. It really is. I mean, it's Carlton Cuse and um, Damon Lindelof, you know, they wanted to make a good first impression, I guess. <laughs> yeah. We get it, guys. You guys are good at your jobs. <laughs> this is your show. You know what you're doing. Yeah. We understand. <laughs> On the island, Locke and Boone are examining the body. Locke says that he was probably well off. Could have been dead between two and ten years. He can't tell. But he looks like a priest and carries Nigerian money and a handgun, just like your typical priest. <laughs> this is very ominous, this whole dead body thing. Yeah, it is. There are so many things that happen to Locke that he could take it as a sign, but he does not. Like, this could be a sign that maybe you should not keep going, you know? Right. Maybe you should turn back. Maybe something bad is about to happen. Gosh. He was just so obsessed with the hatch, though. He wanted... Yeah. He needed to find something to help. <sighs> yeah, it's... I mean, it's so fascinating. It's fascinating because he's right so much of the time, and yet, you know, he, he ignores something like this that should maybe be a red flag. Right. And it also seems like it should be a big red flag to Boone. True. <laughs> you know, Boone, who's really only going with Locke, I feel like, because Locke mentioned that detail about Teresa mm -hmm. from his dream. Right. If I was Boone, I'd be like, dude, this is not going to end well. Let's turn around and regroup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boone's whole role in all of this is very interesting as well. It, yeah. Because I it feel is. like a lot of people just like to blame what happens to Boone completely on Locke, and I just don't think that's totally fair. But we'll get to that when we get to it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we will. On the beach, the ocean and commotion are driving Sawyer crazy. Kate says that's it, and she drags Sawyer to Jack. She watches on as he runs some tests. Jack runs down his list of important medical questions, including whether or not Sawyer's ever had sex with a prostitute. 
Sawyer is irritated by the question, and Kate <laughs> smiles when Sawyer says yes. Jack continues asking him whether or not he's had any sexually transmitted diseases when Sawyer tells him to go to hell and walks away. <laughs> Kate begins to chastise Jack when he interrupts her, saying Sawyer needs glasses. Oh, I watched this scene like five times. <laughs> I was crying laughing. It's so good. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. It's so weird to see Jack do this. <laughs> I know. I have like this... It's like, I don't, I feel like there's some sort of cognitive dissonance in watching Jack, like, very seriously screw with him. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it feels like he's reached a breaking point with Sawyer. Yeah. And, like, instead of doing what he would normally do, which I guess is just yell at him and be irritated, he's like, no, I'm taking this new approach. <laughs> I've had enough. Yeah, that's true. I, I like that reading. <laughs> I think he has reached his breaking point. Yeah. And I think he's been watching Kate kind of connect with Sawyer the last, I mean, it's been a while, actually, the last, like, maybe 10 episodes. She's definitely been getting closer to him, and Jack has been watching and not liking it. Mm -hmm. So he's firing back. <laughs> he wants, yeah. He wants Kate to know what kind of guy Sawyer is. Exactly. He's <laughs> embarrassing Sawyer, and it's amazing. I love it so much. <laughs> if Sawyer did this to Jack, you would be so mad. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I just don't care. I just love it so much. I mean, with Sawyer's track record, he, I mean, he's a little embarrassed for like 10 minutes. Like, it's not like Kate is going to use it against him, no. of all people, you know? He can take it. He can it's totally fine. take it. <laughs> yeah. He dish it out. You got to expect it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Boone is asking why Locke can barely walk, but Locke wants him to stop asking. He falls to the ground, and Boone says he's taking him back to Jack. Locke says that Jack wouldn't know the first thing about what is wrong with him. He tells Boone about being paralyzed and how the island cured him. It made him whole. Now the island's trying to take it back, but he doesn't know why. He just knows he needs to follow that plane, that it will help them get into the hatch. They have to keep going, he knows it, and convinced by Locke's determination, Boone helps him up. Oh, gosh. Locke is so stubborn. <laughs> he is very stubborn. That is so true. <laughs> I've always felt like Locke should drop this knowledge on people more often. Yeah. Me too. It explains so much of what he does, and people are so baffled by Locke constantly. I guess not so much so far, but later, people are so frustrated and confused by him. And if he would just explain his situation... Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially, oh, can you imagine if he had had a conversation with Jack? Yes. Ugh. Oh, I wish that had <laughs> happened now. Oh, that would have been so interesting. Something to look forward to, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, like, Boone is completely on board when he hears this because it is amazing. Like, what happened to Locke was amazing. It's compelling. Yeah. And it explains his passion for all this. And I just... Yeah, I wish he shared it more often. <laughs> Me too. So, I feel like this shows a lot of trust in Boone for him to tell him this, since it's clearly something he doesn't want to tell many people. Right, I feel like, yeah, he doesn't want to be perceived that way. Right, that was so, the old luck. Right, which is understandable. It is, but what a testament to the island that this happened to you, you know? Yeah. But at the same time, like, I can see Jack hearing this and being like, well... You clearly land, like the plane crash lodged your spine back into a certain position. That's why you can walk. Like, I can see him rationalizing it that way. So, yeah, I'm sure he would have. I mean, anyone would have rather than think the island healed you. But I feel like it still would have helped Jack and so many other people understand Locke's mindset. Right. And where he's coming from. That's all true. All the time. In a flashback, Locke shoots a bird and Anthony tells him, Good shot, son. Locke looks very proud. And his father says that he's thankful they've come together while there's still time. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Back on the island, Boone says Teresa was his nanny and he was always mad that his mother wasn't around much. So he would call for her constantly, taking his anger out on her, forcing her to walk up and down the stairs to his room. One day, she slipped and she broke her neck. Locke begins to laugh inappropriately, but it's because he sees the plane that they've been looking for. Boone smiles, and Locke tells him that he's going to have to climb up and find out what's inside. Nope. Turn around, Boone. 
<laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a dark detail from Boone's past. You know? It is, but at the same time, like, this was not really Boone's fault at all. He was just a oh. child. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I'm just imagining if you were six and your nanny fell down the stairs and broke her neck after you had been calling for her. Like, that's kind of traumatic to go through at such a young age. <laughs> that's true. Definitely traumatic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it was his fault at all, but... I feel like Boone feels like it's his fault, so... Yeah. That's a common theme, though. Everyone seems to think everything's their fault. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> also, I'm not... Oh, it seems... Again, it, I feel like I've already said this, but it's at this point, Boone is like almost carrying Locke through the jungle while they're looking for this phantom plane. Like, I'm not sure why Boone is still doing this. I know Locke is just told him this big secret of his, but... When I'm watching the scene, I'm like, what if they're attacked? Like, what if they have to run? Like, mm-hmm. they're screwed, you know? Like, it yeah. just makes me anxious. Like, turn around. Go home. Wait till you can, like, <laughs> well, walk is screwed, on two feet. Could leave. <laughs> right. But, like, it just makes me nervous. And I don't know why Boone's like, hey, like, we probably shouldn't be out here alone when you can't even walk. Maybe we should do this another day. Well, I feel like every time Boone loses his faith, Locke drops a little something to keep him going, you know? At mm, first, it's, you know, the little detail about Teresa and his dream, and then it's his story about being able to walk again. And every time, Boone's like, oh, okay, we'll go a little further. <laughs> right. That's a good point. Locke and his father are in a hospital room about to begin the kidney transplant. Locke pats his father's hand and tells him that this was meant to be. Anthony responds, see you on the other side, son. Hey, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jack approaches Sawyer and mentions that Sawyer reads a lot. He tells him he needs glasses and he's come prepared with a bag full. Sawyer starts trying on glasses and attempting to read his book. But of course, the lenses that help are not the most dashing. Luckily, we have a Saeed and he is able to fashion together a pretty sweet (laughs) pair of glasses from two different pairs. When Sawyer puts them on, Hurley walks by and jokes that he looks like Harry Potter. Kate laughs and Sawyer is annoyed, telling Jack, you love this, don't you? He puts the glasses back on and Kate nods encouragingly. It's so good. It's just it's, great. <laughs> it's so good. And of course, Saeed would know how to weld two pairs of glasses yeah, together. Yeah, no big. Like, yeah. <laughs> just another skill he's got up his sleeve. Right. He can do anything. Not that he ever wears sleeves, but you know. <laughs> And just to point out, Sawyer is reading Watership Down. I had to look that up because I couldn't tell from the cover. But Yeah, I couldn't tell either. I'm glad you you looked that up. <laughs> yeah, and we've already discussed Watership Down. But uh, some added significance to this episode is Watership Down has a chapter called Dea Ex Machina. So oh. no accidents here. <laughs> Clearly not. Boone is climbing a very scary wall of tree roots as ominous music plays in the background. Like, it could not get more foreshadowing or foreboding. (laughs) God, Boone. (laughs) He finally makes it up into the plane, which is clearly not very stable. Locke watches from the ground as Boone makes his way inside. Boone finds a map of Nigeria and the plane tilts, causing a dead body to fall on him. He screams but tells Locke that he's fine. Outside, Locke begins to stand up hobbling toward the plane, asking Boone what he sees. Boone tosses a statue of Mary down to the ground, saying, Here's your sign, Locke. They're drug smugglers. Sure enough, Locke picks up the bag of heroin that came out of the broken statue. He sits on the ground, saying, I don't understand. Boone approaches the cockpit of the plane, and lo and behold, the radio actually works. The plane begins to tilt even more, and Locke starts to tell him to get out. But Boone calls Mayday on the radio, and he actually gets a response. He tells them that they're survivors of the Oceanic 815 crash, but then the plane slips from the tree it's in and comes crashing to the ground. Locke jumps to his feet, falls, and then keeps crawling slash walking towards the plane. He finds Boone, covered in blood, and pulls him out, lifting him onto his back with a groan and lots of effort. And whew, this is oh, a man. big, big, pivotal scene. Yes, it is. And it's almost hard to talk about because the consequences won't really be fully realized in this episode. Yeah, that's true. Still, how do you feel like Locke handled this moment? 
how did Boone handle it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like, uh, I don't know, like looking, <laughs> when they look at this plane, like, are they both insane? This plane is hanging off the edge of a cliff. I mean, it looks like you could blow on it and it would come crashing <laughs> to the ground. Like both of them should have been like, no, this is a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> well, it makes me think of the pilot when Kate and Charlie and Jack, mm-hmm. when they climb up into that plane, which is also like in a very similar situation. Yeah, but it's not hanging off a cliff. It's not quite as bad as this. <laughs> but it it reminds me of that. And I can see why he does it. I can see why he would climb up into it. Like, <laughs> I can't. So crazy to me. (laughs) Like, if I went all this way and, like, nearly dragged Locke to get here, I wouldn't just be like, oh, cool, here it is. Now let's go back. I would have to know what's in it. No, I would not step one foot in that pain. Are you insane? (laughs) God, that thing is literally hanging on my piece of string. Like, ugh. Yeah, I mean, as soon as it starts rocking, like, I don't know why he stays in there at that point. And and Locke tells him to get, I mean, I guess we do know because the radio turns on. It turns on, but like, I'm sorry, who cares? Like, you need to leave. And it's probably still going to work when it falls to the ground if it survived the crash onto the island in the first place. Good point. I can kind of see that instinct, though. Like, they've been on this island for uh, like a month, a month and a half. And no one's coming for them. And then to finally have yeah. like, someone on the other line. And he could be so psyched that he doesn't even notice that the plane is rocking. Yeah. And he doesn't even notice Locke screaming that he needs to get out. Right. I mean, bottom line, he shouldn't have climbed up there and set foot in there in the first place. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just oh, so annoying. Yeah. We had someone on Instagram, Austin815, asked if we would have climbed into that plane, and you totally just answered that question. (laughs) Hell no! You lost your damn mind? Of course not. (laughs) I feel like I would have. (laughs) Tiffany! Oh my god! (laughs) I would at least, like, carefully approach it. If I, like, put a foot on it and it started moving, I'd be like, "Mm, maybe not. (laughs) Tiffany, you would have been dead. Maybe throw some rocks on it and see what happens, like... Yeah, like, why couldn't they have found a way to, like, knock it down? Exactly, and then explore it when it's on the ground. That would have been a much better idea. Oh, it it could have been avoided, is all I'm saying. (laughs) I asked the people on Instagram if Locke was at fault here. I think that's the big question, and we're going to talk about it more in the next episode. But what do you think? Do you think Locke is at fault for boom being in this accident so before i wa- rewatched this episode yesterday i have always 100 percent thought that this accident that boone is in is all Locke's fault it's kind of been one of the things that makes me really angry about Locke when i think about him mm-hmm. <laughs> however when i watched it this time i feel like there's strong arguments for both sides because it's not like Locke didn't hold a gun to boone's head and make him climb up there you know? So yeah. I honestly, and I've, I've always felt like it was 100% Locke's fault. Now, I'm really not so sure. <laughs> yeah, I think Boone looks just as excited as Locke does when they look up at that plane. He doesn't look worried. He's not like, mm, I don't know if I want to do this. He just freaking does it. Yeah, it was an idiotic decision on both of their parts. So <laughs> I kind of think they're both at fault here. Yeah, I just don't think you can completely blame this on Locke. Sure, maybe yeah. some of it is his fault and he he is the reason that they came here, but, you know, Boone is a big boy. He makes his own choices. That's exactly. kind of what it boils down to. Yeah. And when it was starting to get dicey, Locke was screaming like, you need to get out, dude, but he didn't. Yeah, and who knows? It might have already been too late at that point. Yeah. But but yeah, I, I'm it upsets me more what Locke does at the end of this episode. Mm, that, yeah. You know what I mean? I guess we'll talk about it. But. Right. But yeah, Instagram users were literally 50-50 on this one. And there were a lot of people who participated in this poll. So I really? thought that was really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I Yeah. I think you could have... There's strong arguments for either side of that. So... Yep, for sure. I think people kind of tend to side with the victim in these kind of situations, though. Yeah. <laughs> you tend to look at the person who made it out okay and be like, well, why didn't you do more? You know? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Kate is thanking Jack for helping with Sawyer. He tells her that he didn't do it for him and she smiles in response. 
But Locke interrupts the happy moment, bringing Boone in, saying <sighs> that <laughs> Randy is devastated. <laughs> Couldn't have waited ten more minutes. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Locke brings Boone in, saying that he fell off a cliff. Jack gives him a once-over, which looks really bad, and asks Kate to find supplies. He tells Locke he needs to know exactly what happened, but Locke is nowhere to be found. This is what you can't stand, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he didn't even wait five seconds before he pieced out of there. Yeah. This is also what I have an issue with. Really? Yeah. Like, this is, this is the thing that is undoubtedly Locke's fault. I don't think the accident was really Locke's fault, but him piecing out and lying to Jack about what happened, that didn't need to happen. Yeah. I mean, Jack is basing, like, the medical care he gives to Boone from Locke's information. Right. And Locke leaving is, like, just him being, like, you know, what's going on with the hatch and my personal crisis is more important than the fact that you're lying here dying. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. It's awful. It is. And I think he's completely ruled by his emotions in this moment and that's kind of where this comes from but it's inexcusable like boom was so dedicated to you and you're just yeah. like handing him out to dry here and yeah he dragged him there when Locke could hardly walk right oh it's so crazy and you know yes. we haven't talked about Locke's losing his ability to walk and getting it back when the accident happens what do you make of all that i don't know I honestly don't know what to make of that. <laughs> so I feel like it's kind of, I think that Locke's ability to walk is kind of rooted in his faith in the island. And so like the more he is losing his faith in the island and like struggling, then his ability to walk disappears. And when he finally sees the plane, the thing that, the sign, the sign that he was looking for, it like renews his faith. And that's when he can stand again. Like, that's when he starts, like, hobbling towards the plane. Like, before Boone falls or or anything happens, he can stand up. But then when he needs to take Boone back, that's when he gets his full strength. But don't you think that, I mean, when Boone goes up there and he tells Locke that all that's in that plane is heroin, that seems like that's Locke at his lowest point. Mm. You know what I mean? And then when he goes to the hatch in this last scene... And he's so emotional. Like, it doesn't It doesn't seem like he's had that that leap of faith yet. Like, that seems like he's at... He looks devastated. Like, yeah. you know? So yeah, why that's would true. He, like, I like that, that connection between, like, him losing his faith in the island and him losing feeling in his legs. That makes sense. But it just seems like, I don't know, that he wouldn't have gotten that feeling back at right. that point. Well, I think he... I think he gets it back when he sees the plane. Oh, uh, okay. But... When he finds out that it's drugs, like, you would think that that would, like, make him not be able to walk again, you know? If it's true, if it's really, like, a literal connection, that right. sh that should hinder him. But, I don't know, maybe his need to get Boone back to camp is stronger than that. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I'm, like, rereading what I wrote, trying to figure out the exact moment <laughs> when he when he starts walking again. I feel like it's not until Boone crashes in that plane, and then he crawls over and, and gets him out, I think. He's sitting on the ground. Boone finds the map. Boone screams, tells Locke he's okay. And outside, that's when Locke begins to stand up and start walking towards the plane, asking oh, Boone what he sees. Never mind. He's just, like, wanting to know what is in it, and that's when he can stand. And then Boone tosses down the statue, saying, here's your sign. And when he picks up the bag of heroin, he sits down on the ground, saying, I don't understand. Okay. Uh, uh, this is so interesting. God. <laughs> <laughs> Lock episodes are just, like, one fun jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> yeah. They definitely lead to lots of interesting discussion. I'll also just say really quick that that little moment between Jack and Kate is like one of my favorite moments between them ever. <laughs> it's so brief. <laughs> I know, but it's so cute the way they're looking at each other and the way he says I didn't do it for him. I wouldn't be me if I didn't mention that. But anyway, we can move on. <laughs> I know you don't care, but I love that moment so much. <laughs> That's good. You're right. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it made you happy, though. <laughs> it really did. It really did. Back in the hospital, Anthony Cooper is also nowhere to be found. 
Locke asks where his father is, but the nurse says he checked out and he's at home under private care. Locke tries to sit up, but he's in too much pain. Emily walks in and says, It was his idea. I'm sorry, I needed money. When Locke points out that she told him he had no father, she says, That's because it needed to be your idea. He said, That's the only way you'd give him your kidney. It turns out that Anthony arranged everything, but that Emily had wanted to see Locke anyway. Locke says, This can't be happening. He wouldn't do this to me. He begins to cry and rip the tubes out of his arm. <sighs> Locke, your daddy is the worst. <laughs> um, the absolute worst. Also, his mom has some nerve coming to visit him when he's sitting in the hospital. So and- true. I mean, she says that she wanted to see him and, like, meet him. So I guess that's why she comes back, but... I guess, but what did she think was going to happen I when know. she told him that this is all been one huge lie? <laughs> right. Jesus. Hey, I set this up. I'm the reason you're going through all this agony. <laughs> yeah, you can't even get up and walk right now, but it's pretty much all my fault. <laughs> yeah. Awful. At least we can literally say that she is crazy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. To her credit. <laughs> yeah. God, it's so sad, though. It is. Oh, my gosh. Terry O'Quinn breaks my heart. Yeah. Locke, fresh from his surgery and still in pain, drives to Anthony's house. When the gatekeeper won't let him in, he gets out and looks through the gate, saying, you can't do this to me. As he drives away, screaming and crying and beating the roof of his car, we transition to Locke, kneeling with his head against the hatch, banging against it. He says, I've done everything you asked of me, so why did you do this? Why? And just then, a light inside the hatch turns on, and shines up at him as the episode ends. Oh, man. What an ending. (laughs) (laughs) So good. Probably my favorite ending to date. Yeah. It's it's pretty crazy. (laughs) Topping my former favorite ending, which was Locke's wheelchair burning. (laughs) (laughs) You're really all about those Locke episodes. I am. I love it so much. This moment is just so powerful. First of all, Locke has the best theme music, I think, of anyone yes. else in the whole show. It's great, isn't it? It's fantastic. His is the only music that I can instantly recognize as being Locke's. Yeah. Like, I know that everyone kind of has a theme, because I've listened to the soundtrack a couple times, not very often. I'm not very familiar with it, but it's always his theme that jumps out at me. Yeah. It's very distinctive. I wrote that down, too. I was like, the music in this last scene is so good. Yeah, it's so powerful. It's It's got this, like, melancholy thing about it, but it's also really triumphant. Yeah. It's just, it's so good. It really is. Yeah, and again, Terry O'Quinn in this last couple scenes <sighs> when he's driving away from his dad's house. It's just fantastic. If anyone else did the things he does, it would be too much. You know, like, banging the roof of the car, screaming and crying. Like, on paper, that sounds absolutely ridiculous. Like, this is going to be way too melodramatic. Mm -hmm. But he sells it, and it's just so painful to watch. That's so true. It's like you hurt along with him. Yeah. I really do. (laughs) (laughs) I really do. I'm hurting right now. (laughs) I can feel your pain. (laughs) And I love that transition of him beating the roof of his car and then beating the top of the hatch. It's just so good. Yeah. And he gets his sign again. He gets the sign that he needs. Yeah. (laughs) So so what did you think the first time you watched this episode? What did you think about that light in the hatch? Like... What did you think that was? Um, I figured, let's see. I I know I jumped up and down because I was so excited. (laughs) (laughs) Because, you know, me and Locke, two peas in a pod so far. Of course, of course. (laughs) But I I didn't know. I really, that's that's what I love is that I didn't know. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what is this? Yeah. (laughs) Is there a person down there? Is this a machine that has like come to life? It could be so many things. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I thought it was aliens, <laughs> which sounds really crazy, but I don't know. I just got a distinctive alien-like feel. I was like, yeah. oh, it's some alien ship that's just landed there however many years ago. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can kind of see it as like a backwards UFO thing because like, yeah. you get that picture of the UFO and then they shine the light down all of a sudden. 
<laughs> right. And then, like, the fact that they couldn't break into it, I was like, oh, maybe it's some alien technology that humans can't break into. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I ever thought that, like, people being in it was a strong possibility because they've been baiting the top of this hatch for, like, two weeks now. Right. So if someone was down there, they should have heard it. Yeah. Definitely. So I just was always really confused and super, super psyched. <laughs> so that's the end of this. And it's super heartbreaking. I mean, it this is. turn with Anthony is just the worst. It is so sad. And this whole episode has been Locke's struggle with faith. And to get this backstory now, it's just, it's no coincidence. Like, you know, he put such faith in his father mm -hmm. and was so destroyed by it. Right. It's just, ah, God, he's so tragic. <laughs> it is. It's, it's amazing that, I mean, he gets put through more than any human being should get put through. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we haven't even seen some of the worst of it, I feel like. That's coming I know, later. I but know. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> really doesn't, man. So, I mean, when you're thinking about themes and questions for this episode, I feel like we have to talk about faith, right? <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's what I wrote down. It seems like that's all over this episode. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge marker for all Locke episodes, but mm -hmm. this one in particular, I kind of like, I found it a little hard to narrow it down because I just, I was like, faith, 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 faith. What about right. faith, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> And I just kind of focused on how Locke's faith affected his actions and his choices. Uh -huh. But yeah, I I was thinking about off the island, he puts his faith in his parents like right away, kind of what we were talking about, because he wants to, like, he wants to believe in them, so he chooses to. Right. And he wants to believe he's special and destined for greatness and that he has this potential new life with a family. And he's rewarded for that faith with manipulation and endless, endless pain. Yep, yep. <laughs> but it's that faith that caused him to open himself up and to be vulnerable. And John Locke is vulnerable. He is, like, one of the most vulnerable characters on this show. He is always, like, idealistic and open to possibilities and when you're that vulnerable, you're gonna get hurt. That's interesting that you'd say that. I feel like he comes off very vulnerable in his flashbacks. Mm -hmm. But on the island, I feel like he's the opposite of vulnerable. Mm. Just like, I feel like his connection with the island is so strong. The way he, I don't want to say takes matters into his own hands, but the way he like, you know, try, he tries to help everyone on the island with their problems and mm -hmm. to solve it the way he thinks it should be solved. So I don't know. Well, I think whenever you're extremely passionate and committed to something, especially something like kind of weird and abstract, that that can make you vulnerable in itself. Mm. This is something that very few people on the island are going to understand. And so in that way, he's just kind of he's vulnerable to skepticism. And mm, that's a good point. People have issues with him. <laughs> With good reason, but... And it also, this undying faith he has, like you said earlier, it makes him obsessive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it blinds him to reality sometimes. And for for good and for bad, I think that helps him sometimes, but it's his. It's also his weakness. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's arguably one of his biggest weaknesses. Yeah, but I feel like... Ultimately, he's rewarded for his faith on the island, whereas, you know, off the island, he's completely crushed for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I wrote down when I was talking about faith in the theme that I was mm -hmm. thinking of. Because I was just thinking of the question, like, is putting your faith in something you can't necessarily see or prove a good idea? Yeah. And I feel like you've already kind of said this, but, you know, you could say his faith is tested on the island when his legs start to fail. But, I mean, he's stubborn about it, and in the end, he's rewarded with seeing that light from the hatch. Yeah. Whereas, you know, off the island in his flashbacks, he puts his faith in his father, and he's betrayed, and things are terrible. So... Yeah. I mean, it is such a testament to who he is that he continues to 
put his faith in things that are just gonna that they should just backfire on him yeah they usually do and he just keeps doing it over and over again because he's so dedicated yeah he is he is special it's been said before yeah. <laughs> on this show yeah no normal person would <laughs> would do this <laughs> nope certainly not <laughs> I just love him. He's so great. <laughs> how, many, how many times have you said that in this episode? <laughs> I don't think I've said it enough. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so I don't think I did this last time we had a John Locke episode, but we have to talk about his name because it's very rare that we have a character whose first and last name directly relate to somebody, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a real person. Yeah. And... Everyone's probably already familiar with the philosopher John Locke, who... Let me just read this for you because I can't actually explain John Locke very well. <laughs> okay. It's been a long time since I took philosophy. <laughs> Same. So I'm just going to read this little overview of John Locke and then we can discuss. <laughs> okay. John Locke laid much of the groundwork for the Enlightenment and made central contributions to the development of liberalism. He was trained in medicine and advanced a theory of the self as a blank page or tabula rasa with knowledge and identity arising only from accumulated experience. His political theory of government by the consent of the governed as a means to protect life, liberty, and a state deeply influenced the United States founding documents. His essays on religious tolerance provided an early model for the separation of church and state. Um, he greatly influenced philosophers such as David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant. And fun fact, John Locke the philosopher met prominent English politician Anthony Cooper in 1666 at Oxford. Shut up. Is that Locke real? <laughs> it's totally real. Locke persuaded Cooper to undergo an operation for his liver infection that saved his life. What? The what? Oh my god. When I read that, I was like, that can't be right. And I looked it up in another place, and it's true. <laughs> That's insane. Isn't that? No accidents. <laughs> wow. Wow. I know. Just let it sink in. <laughs> you just blew my mind. <laughs> and yeah, I noted those other philosophers because... You know, obviously we have Rousseau, who we've already met as a character, mm -hmm. but we're also going to meet a character later on with the last name Hume, so... Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> Not playing around these lost writers, are they? <laughs> this show is unbelievable. Wow. I love this connection with John Locke and the blank slate. Because yeah. what have we been talking about with almost every Locke moment in everyone else's stories? He's been telling them to start over and right. that they have a blank slate. That's like this the main theme for season one. Yeah, for sure. I've been thinking that too. <laughs> so that is just so cool. The Anthony Cooper thing blew my mind. I did not know that. <laughs> I had, did not know that either. That is insane i always knew that like i knew of john locke the philosopher right but i didn't know him very well and so the tabula rasa thing was really cool but the anthony cooper thing is just over the top ridiculously cool it really <laughs> is oh my god wow that makes me like this episode 10 times more than i already did <laughs> That's good. At this, at the beginning of this episode, you were like, I like it. I don't know if I love it. <laughs> now I think I might love it. It's so good. Aw. <laughs> did I sell it hard enough? Because I think I worked really hard. No, <laughs> you did, Tiffany. And yeah, I feel I like it a great deal more than I did at the beginning of this episode. So. Uh, there's always something to reach for with Log. <laughs> <laughs> so even if it's not meant to be there, you will find it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but yeah, do you have anything else you want to talk about? You made me love like, this episode a lot more. Just, Aww. it's so well written, which again, Carlton Cuse, Damon Lindelof, that's to be expected. But the way they hit on that theme over and over again, it's so, it's so tight. Like there's no, they don't waste any moments in this episode. Yeah, no. Yeah, I feel like you have to put it up there with one of the best of this season. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, for sure. And if if such a thing could be objective, I, I think, yes, it's so significant and so powerful. And it really it just it leads into so much of where they're going. It's, yeah. it's definitely a, a door opening kind of episode. Yeah. 
I still think what he does at the end of this episode by just leaving Boone is kind of unforgivable, but it's just so interesting. Like yeah. his reasoning, his mindset. So, yeah. Yep. And we will deal with the consequences of that in next week's episode. Yes, we will. All right, everybody, that is it for us. If you enjoyed the show, please stop on by iTunes and rate, review, subscribe to Freckles and Blondie over there. It's such an easy, helpful thing you can do to support the show and increase our audience. And hey, who doesn't want more Losties in the world, right? (laughs) You can also donate a dollar a month or whatever you can afford on our Patreon page. The link is on our website. Every single dollar is very, very appreciated. And as always, thank you to those of you who are already lending your support and writing and writing reviews. We love you. Yes, we really do. (laughs) Next week, we're discussing Do No Harm. And this is a Jack episode, so Randy is super psyched. I am. (laughs) You know how I feel about Jack, so. (laughs) (laughs) But there's a lot going on in this episode, so I'm actually not dreading it as much as you might think. (laughs) Yeah, there's some serious stuff that goes down next week so yeah it's i know it's going to be another one of those dense episodes yeah definitely it's going to be interesting dealing with the fallout of this one so until next week i'm tiffany and i'm randy and this has been freckles and blondie